Good morning. Uh, this is Chris, and I'm here to talk about the last week of Jesus. In particular, today we're starting our day-by-day series that will take us through the next eight days up to Resurrection Sunday, looking at what happened in the last week of Jesus' ministry, day by day, chronologically. It's going to be just a lot of fun. Um, if you were with us last Sunday, we started our large overview of the last week of Jesus, and we'll wrap that up tonight. But today we start this day by day look at the last week of Jesus. And we start on Sunday. And that's Sunday, March 29th, 33 AD. And we're looking right now at what happened that day. And what happened that day is Jesus arrived in Bethany. And a couple other things happened. Uh, he had this dinner that we're going to look at, look at uh, at Simon the Leopard's house. And he was anointed by Mary for his burial. And then we get this plot to um, basically kill Lazarus. Now, at this point in time, you're probably wrapping up. You've already gone to church, this, uh, hopefully this, uh, this morning. And you're sitting there going, wait a second, Chris. It's Sunday. It's Sunday before Easter. And where are my palms? Where are the where are the palms? This is the this is the day of the triumphal entry, right? Well, no. Tradition has it that this happened on Sunday, but research has shown us that the triumphal entry actually happens on Monday. We'll talk more about that tomorrow, but uh, I just wanted to give you where I'm looking and finding that at. And there's this wonderful research uh, called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. And it goes through and talks about the research around what happened on what day and trying to figure that out the best they can. This also comes into play when we talk about Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But today... We have to look at the events that happened today on Sunday. And um, if you look at the events that happened on Sunday, they don't look all that, uh, you know, detailed. I mean, when when I say that, they they don't don't look like it's all that important. You know, uh, we get this idea of Jesus arriving, he has a dinner, and that's about it. Uh, But let's look at it in in sort of a three-act play, if you would. Uh, The first thing that happens is I call it an introduction, Uh, this journey of Jesus that we're going to learn about, but we're also going to learn about this plot, this plot of the chief priest, and and that's happening in in the temple. So if you imagine this split screen, you see Jesus coming in, um, you know, into Jerusalem, and then it, it sort of fades out and goes to the temple, and you get a little conversation. That's sort of the introduction. Then we get the bulk of the, the message of what happened today in, in a dinner that happened in Simon the leper's house. And uh, we, f- we see who the players are, the, this, who's serving and who's seated. Um, we see this burial anointment, and then we see this lesson to the disciples, and you start to see the plot thicken of how this last week is going to go. And then after that's done, what happens is... We, we sort of cut back uh, to the temple again, and we see this plot uh, to, you know, to kill not only Jesus, but to kill Lazarus. It's pretty cool. It's, it's setting up our last week. So uh, what I'm going to do today, and pr- tomorrow also, uh, but more today than probably all of the week, is, is read. Is read the scripture. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, that John MacArthur did, which harmonizes the Gospels, but in a different way. A lot of times when you see um, a harmony of the Gospels, you see basically, you know, three or four different columns, and it shows, um, you know, each part that the Gospels agree on uh, from a, a coverage standpoint. And you see it that way. John MacArthur did it a little bit different way, where he basically made it one narrative. So I'm going to read from his book called The One Perfect Life, 
And basically it's what happened this day. And then after I read it, what we'll do is go through, highlight a couple of points, and then put some application to it. And that will be today. So you can, you'll be able to see this uh, on the screen. Uh, forgive me if I'm looking down because I'm going to be actually just reading through the scripture. So here we go. So this is how it all took place according to the scripture. Again, Sunday in 33 AD. And the Passover of the Jews was near. And many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Now here's here's this scene coming over uh, in the temple. Then they sought Jesus and spoke amongst themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given commands that if anyone knew where he was, Jesus, he should report it that they might seize him. Now you get this next scene of Jesus' pathway, his journey coming in. And it came to pass six days before the Passover. Jesus drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and came to Bethany at the Mount of Olives, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And then Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. We get the supper scene now. They made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then, as he sat at the table, Mary came to him, having an alabaster flag containing a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head, and she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair as he sat at the table, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But then his disciples saw it. There were some who were indignant amongst themselves and said, Why this waste? And they criticized her sharply. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus, when he was aware of it, uh, he said to them, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now cut to the next scene, this last scene. Now a great many of the Jews knew he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So that's the gospel story uh, for this day, for this Sunday. And um, what we're going to do now is just we're going to go and we're going to hit some highlights, some points that really uh, the gospel writers are trying to, to telegraph to us, to tell us about it. And, you know, I, when you think about the gospels, again, I'll, I'll hit this again, which is, you know, the gospels are the pinnacle, the pinnacle of the writing of the Bible. 
they, they basically tell the story of Jesus' mission and his missionary work here on earth for three years. Uh, and really his whole life, 30 plus years, but these last three years in particular. And they spent 29% of their time recording the gospel on this last week. So they're telling us a lot of what happened the last week because it's important. The last week was incredibly important. So let's take a look. Let's dig into the scripture, and you'll see we're going to go right through the scripture again, uh, the story again, but I'm going to highlight some things. So first, the Passover of the Jews was near. Now, in the Gospel of John in particular, this is the third explicit mention of a Passover in which Jesus' public ministry happened. The first two, uh, John 2.13, and then the second, John 6. Four. So this is the third Passover of Jesus' public ministry. Now, let's look at this next phrase. They sought Jesus. The Jews who filled Jerusalem for Passover were wondering if Jesus would show up, all right? And, and they were actively seeking him. Okay, so this plot of the chief priests and the Pharisees was known widely enough to really piqued the curiosity of everybody in Jerusalem. And you got to remember, uh, uh, all of the, the Jews came in uh, basically for the Passover. They were all coming to Jerusalem. So th- this is the talk of the town. This is the talk of the town. Will Jesus show up? And if anyone knew that Jesus was there, they were to, to basically, they're, they're spies looking for Jesus, and they were supposed to go and tell the, um, the, the chief priest and, and uh, the Pharisees that they found him, you know? So they're out actively looking for Jesus, um, and they wanted to seize him. And that's going to be one of our points, uh, so keep that in mind as we go on. They were actively seeking him, um, and, and, and they were obviously plotting against him. Everything has come to a head. All right, so let's go on to the next part of it. So six days before Passover is when Jesus came. And then he came, you, we see the route that he came. So the first thing is, um, you know, depending on how they track time, this may have been the previous Saturday with the Passover coming six days later on Thursday evening through the sunset Friday. We'll talk about those timings uh, a little bit later. Or it may have been the, this Sunday. Um, it, it, it just all depends on the, the, um, the way that you look at time. And we'll talk about that here when we get into Thursday of how there's different ways, even within Jewish people, to count the beginning of the day. Uh, there, there is Jerusalem time and there's Galilean time based, in, based on when it starts. Does the day start at sunset or sunrise? We'll talk about that later, so just keep that in mind. Now let's look at the path of Jesus. Now you, you saw this map before. And this gives you the overview of basically where uh, or where everything is in it. I'm going to highlight and come in a little closer <clears throat> and give you a little bit of an idea of the path, uh, at least where you can see it a little bit. Jesus would have come down through uh, Ephraim, and he would have come down basically through Bethany. So, um, this map over here um, gives you a little bit of an, of an idea where you can see where Bethpage is on the map. And then you can see a little bit where the Mount of Olives is and there where Bethany is. So if I go back to this map, uh, Jesus is going to be coming down through Ephraim, almost through that road to Emmaus. He's going to skirt Jerusalem, just come right to the side of it, which is where Bethpage is and then down across the Mount of Olives into Bethany. You can sort of see that a little bit better uh, in this map where it's blown up. And um, again, all of this uh, really um, was in a close proximity of everything. We talked about that last Sunday. So Bethpage is a small town near Bethany, just east of Jerusalem on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives. It is mentioned in plenty of places in Scripture, and uh, it is um, 
it is you know very much connected to uh, what we'll see tomorrow in the triumphal entry. Uh, I- interesting, its uh, name literally means house of unripe figs. And then Bethany, uh, which is pretty important from the standpoint, is the hometown of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. It's on the eastern slope of Mount of Olives, about two miles east of Jerusalem. And this is where Jesus is going to stay uh, for the most part uh, during this last week. And then Mount Olives stood between Bethany and Jerusalem, and it's the main peak uh, of a ridge running north to south, located east of the Kidron Valley, which is, again, if you're looking at this picture, you can sort of see the valley. I wish I wish you could see me pointing at the screen. Uh, but anyways, you can see the Kidron Valley there. Um, and, um, you know, the Kidron Valley has a lot of meaning to it, uh, especially in end times, but throughout the history of, of the Jews. So there we go. Uh, that gives you sort of a good, hopefully a good lay of the land. Now, the next thing we hear is that um, Jesus is now at a dinner. He's at the dinner uh, and, and at the house of Simon the leopard. Simon was almost certainly someone who Jesus had healed of leprosy, for leopards were deemed unclean and therefore not permitted to socialize or even live in the city. Um, this may have been a planned meal for Jesus for the gratitude of him basically healing him. So um, we know uh, from this part of the scripture that Lazarus, we call him Lazarus, or, or Simon the leopard, sorry, you call him Simon the leopard, uh, you, 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 <laughs> he, he's healed. Otherwise, he is n- unclean and they can't be around him for this dinner. So um, Jesus healed him. That's what we see. And a couple of things to point out, Martha is doing Martha's thing. She's serving, but Lazarus is sitting there at the table with him. Wouldn't that be something to see? Six months earlier, Lazarus was dead, and Jesus basically raised him from the dead. Now he's sitting at the table uh, in the house of, uh, of Simon, who he healed, with Lazarus, a guy who was dead and brought back to life. It's a pretty interesting uh, uh, group of folks sitting around his table right now. So let's go on. Now, uh, this scene is, you know, we've, we've heard so much about um, Mary, this alabaster flask of oil. So um, we're going to talk about the cost of it here in just a second. But, um, you know, Mark sets the value of, uh, of it at more than 300 denarii. That's nearly a year's wage. Very costly. Very costly indeed. Um, even the expensive flag, uh, the bottle that it was kept in, is expensive. Okay, so this is this is a big deal. That's like taking basically a year of your wage and dumping it, you know, um, or paying for something as a gift. Um, that's pretty pretty amazing. So um, um, let's, let's look at a couple of these things. Um, so the, 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 the oil itself, very expensive, 300 denarii, like we said, that's a year's wage. Um, it, it's, it says a pound, but the, the, the actual Greek is about three quarters of a pound, practically 12 ounces. Okay. Not, not, terrible. Now this word spikenard, depending on the version, uh, translation of the Bible that you're, you're using, may not even show up. In the uh, New American uh, Standard Bible, which I use, they translate it literal, which means pure nard, okay? So uh, it, that's the, the actual Greek word means pure nard. In the oil, is, it's an oil uh, that's derived from the root of a you guessed it, nard plant, um, which is native of India. And when they talk about pure, basically it means, you know, obviously gener- uh, genuine, unadulterated, you know, pure. And that's what made it so costly. So this was, 
this was a, your essential oils on steroids, okay? I, again, um, average uh, yearly income right now, I think in uh, Lago Vista, is somewhere around sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Imagine buying a bottle of 12-ounce liquid for $70,000. <laughs> That's what Mary did here. Uh, and you know she anointed Jesus. Now, now, uh, if, if when when they're having a dinner, um, it's not like here where we're sitting in chairs. They're reclined back. Uh, you've seen sort of pictures of that on pillows. And um, you know when you come in, you were you, you somebody would wash your feet. I mean that we'll talk more about that during the pass or the uh, oh uh, the last supper. But but uh, this anointing was something unusual, and and it symbolized uh, basically humility. If you look at it, if you wash somebody's feet, that is that is humble servant type things. And then washing it with her hair, I mean, that's total devotion. Um, but it didn't go over well. It didn't go over well. Um, there were some that were indignant. Now, we know that um, Judas was the spokesperson who, who voiced the complaint, uh, complaint at first. And, uh, you know, John does not pull punches with basically calling him a liar, a hypocrite, all that kind of fun stuff. But it's evident that the other disciples sort of uh, jumped on the bandwagon and were very quick to, to uh, voice uh, sympathy for, for um, uh, Judas's uh, protest. And so, um, you know... Uh, it's like, mind your own business. But, you know, we can't say that. But anyways, uh, Judas started the complaint trail, and everybody sort of went through it. And again, it, 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 it wasn't because Judas um, basically wanted the money to go to the poor. He wasn't altruistic in that way. He wanted, I mean, you know, he's a thief. He wanted to steal the money. So this idea of, you know, why, you know, why are you doing this? Um, and you shouldn't have done this. We should have sold it to the poor. It's, you know, it's this high, high brow righteousness um, was totally false. It was totally false. Um, but then we get Jesus's message. And we'll talk about this in a little bit uh, when we get the application. Uh, I've always... Um, I've always wondered when Jesus said, for you have the poor with you always. Um, you know, Jesus certainly was not disparaging the ministry to the poor, especially uh, um, so soon after the lesson of the sheep and the goat judgment, which was in uh, Matthew 25. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about that later. Um, he was revealing the higher priority Um he was revealing the higher priority, which is basically the worship to him. So, um, you know, I'll park here for just a second. And that is, you know, a lot of times we want to jump on the ministry of doing good. Uh, of, of uh, I don't want to disparage anything, you know, the, uh, um, you know, church under the bridge, you know, feeding the poor, you know, all that kind of fun stuff, all very good, very good, very worthwhile things. Um, those are ministries that should happen. But Jesus is telling he, us here from a priority standpoint that you'll always have the poor, but you won't always have him. When you think about discipleship and you think about what we are supposed to be doing, what our mission is. Our mission, our commandment is to go and make disciples. The priority that Jesus shows here is that we should go and make disciples. That's more important. The ministry to the poor is very important, but is not the most important. If we go and do church under the bridge, or we go and, and do the food pantry, all great stuff, all stuff that we should do, but we never tell anybody about Jesus, 
then what have we done? You know, we really haven't done anything. Uh, we've just done good stuff. And those good works are great, but Jesus and, and evangelizing and discipleship is much, much more important from a priority standpoint. This, is, this verse has always bugged me, but I think I'm finally starting personally at least to get it, if that makes sense. Now, Jesus is very explicit in the fact that this was for my burial. This does not mean necessarily that Mary was consciously aware of the significance of her act. It is doubtful that she knew that his uh, that Jesus was uh, death was even approaching, or at least how close it was. But her anointing of Jesus became the symbol of that anticipation of his death and burial. Uh, Mary performed this act to signal her devotion, but as the case, uh, you know, as is in the case of uh, Caiaphas, her acts reveals more than she realized at the time. If you remember, um, Caiaphas said one man needed to die for the nation. Um, so, you know, this telegraphs, Jesus is telegraphing, what Mary has done is telegraphing what the end of this week is going to be, the burial, the burial, and the resurrection. Um, hey, you want to talk about prophecy fulfilled? Look at the line right there. We're talking about this event. So this promise of that it will be told in memorial uh, to her, <laughs> well, guess what? We just fulfilled that prophecy today because we're talking about it. So this last scene, you know, they when when we went back and we talked about Lazarus being raised from the dead, and then um, this idea of the, the chief priests and Pharisees plotting against Jesus, which happened really even further back than that in, in his three-year ministry, but it came to a head. What we see here is um, that not only are the Pharisees and the chief priests plotting to kill Jesus, but they want to kill the reason and the signs that made people believe. The Pharisees signaled both a conscious and deliberate move away from the superficial, I'm sorry, this phrase, um, uh, signaled both a conscious and deliberate move away from the superficial religion of the Jewish leaders and move towards this true faith in Jesus as Messiah and Son of God. So people were starting to believe in Jesus because of what they saw him do, and it's becoming less superficial. And, and that's talk, let's end this uh, with, with basically, what does it all matter? You know, what does it all matter? Um, as this story is unfolding, the first thing that I think from an application we can take, and it's sort of poignant as we're all locked down uh, in uh, coronavirus shutdown, and that is that Jesus is con in control of the timeline. Pharisees are seeking to, to uh, kill him, and we'll find that they didn't want to do it during the feast, um, the Passover feast, but Jesus was in control. From a political standpoint, the second thing that we can take is the established uh, religious leaders see Jesus as a serious threat to their position and their power, and they don't want any of that. And many, third point, many of the Jews are believing in Jesus because of his miracles, and as the week unfolds, that belief in Jesus will be strengthened and become less superficial. Um, and I think that's the thing that we want to get to, is the miracles made them believe that Jesus was a prophet. They would even believe that he was a very good man. But as we get closer and closer to the death, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, that 
that faith is going to become less superficial and a realization that Jesus is the Son of God. So, there is Sunday. So tonight we will finish up the last week uh, in, in our big overview, so, so part two. And then tomorrow, I'll see you at noon for the triumphal entry. God bless y'all. Um, talk to you soon.